when FDR was inaugurated president at the high point of his life, when Eleanor would reach the highest possible station for a woman in the United States as First Lady. At the ceremony, there when FDR was being sworn in, Eleanor's thoughts were with Lorena. There, wearing a sapphire ring that Lorena had given to her, she would say, quote, All day I've thought of you. Oh, I want to put my arms around you. I ache to hold you close. Your ring is a great comfort. I look at it and think, she does love me, or I wouldn't be wearing it. Now, some historians have tried to just focus on that and literally just say, they were gal pals. But subsequent letters between them, there were over 3,000 letters in all. Eleanor would sometimes write to Lorena more than once a day, contain language that honestly can only be interpreted one way. Hi, thanks for tuning into the inaugural video of Cruising the Demi Mount Queer History in the World of Twilight. To start things off, I think I have a really interesting video for you folks. We're going to be looking at the First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, and her hidden bisexuality. What really fascinated me about her story was that so much of what made her the most respected first lady in American history, what made her what many have called a model of exemplary citizenship, her social activism, her commitment to feminism, her commitment to racial justice, her commitment to the American working class, and her drafting of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights came from her love, her passionate love, of other women. She was very much a product of the lesbian culture that existed in the early 20th century. What also fascinated and depressed me was the way in which her queerness was systematically erased. Erased by her son, erased by historians, erased by those around her, but also how that history was recovered and how we came to learn the full breadth of her personality. We're also going to be taking a look at her sexual relationship with a journalist by the name of Lorena Hickok. So, if this interests you, strap yourselves in and let's get started. Sources for this video include A Queer History of the United States by Michael Bronsky, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers by Lillian Fatterman, Queering Eleanor Roosevelt by Jennifer Reed, and Out of the Closet and Into History, The Eleanor Roosevelt Lorena Hickok Affair by Robert Cohen. Now, Jennifer Reed, in her article, Queering Eleanor Roosevelt, gives a very interesting and expansive definition of how Eleanor lived a queer life within this context. For Jennifer Reed, it's not just a matter of Eleanor having sexual relationships with other women that defined her as queer, but the way that she looked at the world and the way that she behaved within it. And this is something that I want to say at the beginning of this video, because it's a thread that runs through her life. Even when she was not in an explicitly sexual relationship with other women, you can still see this transgressive queer spirit at work. So here's how Jennifer Reed defines Eleanor's queerness. Quote, the way Roosevelt created her life, the methodology behind the subjectivity she created was queer. Not only operating in between the categorical lines, although that was part of it, her expansive affectional capacity, her ability to love intensely outside of heteronormativity, and her positioning as a woman outside the norms of femininity make her queer. And that queerness, that queer energy, shaped the incredible contributions she made to American culture." End quote. You see, there were so many demands imposed upon Eleanor because of her race, gender, and class. Because of her gender, society would have expected her to 
conform and stay sexually monogamous with one man, her husband. Because of her race, there was a tremendous social expectation for her to remain loyal to white supremacy. And because of her class, she was expected to have a distance from working Americans and at the end of the day to work to advance the interest of oligarchs and not the working class. But as we'll see in this video, Eleanor butted up against those expectations and transgressed them. And that is, according to Miss Reed, something that can be read in a queer context. Now, I'd like to start by looking at Eleanor's relationship with her husband, FDR. The two of them had a very interesting dynamic. Quote, the Roosevelt's relationship was more a merger than a marriage, an affectionate and hugely effective partnership based on shared past and mutual interest, but without passion or intimacy. And that relationship would suffer a very serious blow in 1918 when Franklin had an affair with one Lucy Mercer. However, rather than the two divorcing and splitting up, they integrated it into their relationship, which I find interesting. It resulted in an open marriage. Quote, she agreed to stay married to him loved him, and continued a meaningful partnership that was an extraordinary force in American politics. Her heart at least enlarged and went elsewhere. Of course, this was true for FDR as well. The Roosevelts created an intimate relationship that tolerated their romantic love for others." End quote. Now, I really find that remarkable for a few reasons. Um, number one, you know, this is early 20th century. Eleanor does have the advantage of class. She is the daughter of oligarchs, but it is still very much a man's world. So for a married woman to have a romantic and sexual life apart from her husband and for the husband to tolerate that second life is really remarkable for that period of time. Also, I find it interesting that, in a sense, we can consider this to be a queer relationship to some extent, in that open relationships were quite rare at this point in time. So this really opened up a lot of possibilities for Eleanor. Quote, from 1920 to the end of her life, Eleanor Roosevelt lived in two worlds, the world she made for herself and the social world into which she was born. Eleanor Roosevelt never abandoned that familiar world, but she did redefine her place in it. She had the courage to speak and to act, to bear witness, to disrupt and change it profoundly." End quote. So Eleanor's first encounter, at least that I'm aware of, with queer women was with Elizabeth Reed and Esther Lapp. They were a lesbian couple of radical activists in Greenwich Village, and Eleanor became quite close to them. Quote, in the early 1920s, Eleanor Roosevelt spent as much time as possible with Esther Lapp and Elizabeth Reed. During the White House years, Lapp suggested that she rent a floor on 11th Street. It became Eleanor Roosevelt's sanctuary, a hiding house from the press, and the rituals of First Ladyhood. And this friendship that Eleanor had with a lesbian couple, or something that was at least just a friendship with a lesbian couple, quote, shaped the skills, knowledge, and confidence that Roosevelt needed to become the political person she became in the 1920s, end quote. And it's through this couple that Eleanor joins the ranks of the new women. This was a generation of women in the early 20th century who experienced the sharpest edge of patriarchy growing up. You know, this is a period of time that not only do women not have the right to vote, in a lot of cases, they don't even have the right to their own bank account. It was a really terrible time to be a woman. But this was a generation that was involved in the suffrage movement and that was involved in women flexing their might as women and demanding a place for themselves, the freedom to live their life authentically as they see fit, and the freedom to have their voice heard in society. It's in a queer context that Eleanor first really gets a chance to develop those values. 
The next really important relationship with queer women that I want to draw attention to is that between Eleanor Roosevelt and Molly Dusen. Now, Molly was a political activist in a lesbian relationship with another woman by the name of Polly Porter. And Eleanor and her formed a very effective partnership. They came to wield serious power in the Democratic Party with an eye particularly to getting women into positions of power. They were both determined to use their status and their abilities to bring this generation of new women into the political process. To give some idea as to how close their relationship was, Eleanor once said, quote, the nicest thing about politics is lunching with you on Mondays. Now, it's in the 1920s that Eleanor really becomes embedded in the lesbian community when she enters a Boston marriage with one Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman. Now, Boston marriages were an extremely interesting social arrangement that existed among women in the 19th and early 20th centuries. A lot of people today tend to read Boston marriages as being explicitly lesbian relationships, but That wasn't necessarily the case. Because the world had gone so mad with patriarchy, there were 101 reasons for heterosexual women who had the financial opportunity to ignore marriage and cohabitate together, often for their whole lifetime, and forming an intense emotional bond that normally we would today associate with heterosexual marriage. And these bonds were absolutely profound. When you read stories in the 19th century of presumably heterosexual women in these Boston marriages, they were so full of mutual support and optimism and hope and fidelity. Um, They're they're really something that I think anyone today should aspire to have one of these sorts of friendships uh, because they were really inspiring relationships. Um, Now, obviously, a large number of lesbians were in these relationships, but it's difficult to determine exactly how many of these relationships had a sexual component and how many did not. And another thing that really complicates this is the history of the erasure of bisexual and lesbian women. There are all sorts of stories recounted by Lillian Fatterman in her book, Surpassing the Love of Men, uh, which is a history of queer women in America, where women would be in sexual relationships with one another, but then their heirs or someone will get access to their diaries and just rip up the sections of their diary that reveal these kinds of relationships. And as we'll see later in this video, Eleanor Roosevelt was absolutely a victim of this, where evidence of her bisexuality was quite intentionally erased by those around her and by subsequent historians. So because of the loss of records having to do with this relationship, it is, quote, impossible to recapture either the tone or the precise geometry of their friendship. But we do know that the three of them forged an extremely close bond. For example, in 1925, FDR supervised the construction of an estate that the three of them would live at together called Val Kill. Uh, Val from the valley location and Kill from Fall Kill, the name of the stream on the property. Uh, Even though FDR supervised the construction, the three of them paid $12,000 for it. Now, Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman were in a sexual relationship with each other, but... Eleanor was extremely close to that relationship. Quote, The first summer she spent there, she and her two friends all slept for a time in the same dormitory-like bedroom upstairs. In a proximity, some visitors found startling. Even their towels were embroidered with their entwined initials. And it was at Valkyll that these women as well as an other by the name of Carolyn O'Day, a progressive New York congresswoman, set up three initiatives to help people less privileged than themselves. 
The first was the Todd Hunter School. This is something that educated underprivileged folks, and Eleanor taught there. She took her duties so seriously that even when her husband became governor of New York in 1928, and she was forced to take on whole new responsibilities as New York's first lady, she continued to set aside time teaching there. Another was the Valkill Furniture Factory. This went to retraining and employing out of work farmers. Now, Nancy Cook was in charge of the furniture factory itself, but Eleanor was the major marketer of the furniture. A third initiative, and the one that really had the greatest impact on Eleanor, was the Women's Democratic News. This is something that Eleanor spent a great deal of time writing for, and it really honed her skills as a writer. It's important to remember that this isn't just some filthy rich woman who's got a couple of hobbies to make her feel better. Historians see Valkyll Enterprises as an act of rebellion on Eleanor's part. Quote, At the time she was the daughter of wealth and old American aristocracy, the niece of one president and the wife of another. She was shaped entirely in that rarefied culture in a way she could never escape. Yet, she was an unyielding advocate for those people the American aristocracy needed to define itself against in order to maintain its own privilege. End quote. And I find that really inspiring. You know, here is a woman who was basically born with everything handed to her. And yet, through her passionate love of lesbian women around her, she develops such a strong sense of solidarity that she doesn't just write a couple of checks to a few charities to make herself feel good. No, she gets right down to the brass tacks and dedicates her life to being physically involved in the struggle of those less fortunate than herself. What she wrote for the Women's Democratic News was also interesting and somewhat alien from today's perspective. Eleanor lived at a time where there was a very serious divide between the genders. Men and the women lived thoroughly different lives, and the law, society, culture, all of these things forced the two into two different sets of roles. And her advocacy was designed to address the specific needs of American women. Quote, she thought that women were not like men, and therefore they needed to be treated for what life had handed them, not what life handed men. End quote. And she also expressed a sentiment that was fairly common with a lot of feminists at the time, and that is that feminism needs to concern itself specifically with the plight of mothers, because that is the role that the majority of women were still being forced into. Quote, it was to marriage and home that she saw as the arc of a woman's life, end quote. But even with the different conditions and circumstances that she saw women as being under, she was still adamant that women have a voice independent of men. For example, she said, quote, women in politics would bring a different perspective to the public space, end quote. Now to shift gears for a moment, let's look at how uh, Eleanor's relationships with women affected her commitment to racial justice in the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt became friends with an activist by the name of Mary Bethune, a prominent African-American civil rights activist. And the two of them formed a, quote, long and fruitful friendship, end quote, which allowed them to serve their mutual goal of promoting interracial understanding. And it was through her relationship with Eleanor, as well as her own impassioned activism, that Mary was able to serve in a variety of capacities through FDR's administration. When Eleanor became First Lady of the United States, that's when she was really able to turn the world on its head a bit by demonstrating that she was not going to be an ally from a distance, but in fact 
invited African-American entertainers into the White House, something that had never been done before, invited African-American leaders into the White House for strategy sessions and to meet her husband and to hold public receptions for black civil rights leaders. And at these events, Eleanor didn't do this quietly. She made sure the media was there. She made sure cameras were taking pictures. You know, keep in mind, this is still a shocking moment. During FDR's prosecution of World War II, African-American service members were still segregated in the armed forces. This is still a very bluntly white supremacist society at the time. So by bringing these African-American figures into her home, into the very center of American real and symbolic power, Eleanor Roosevelt was, quote, sending a clear message to the American public. It was her home now, and entry would not be restricted along the lines of race, end quote. It did send shockwaves through the United States, and it was a symbolic uh, and real gesture that she and her husband were going to work toward the cause of racial justice. Now, let's get down to the core of this video, and that is the Eleanor Roosevelt, Lorena Hickok affair. Lorena was a journalist who became a very close friend of Miss Roosevelt. And it was Lorena who really pushed Eleanor to make some of the defining actions of her career. Quote, it was Hick who suggested that Eleanor considered holding her own press conferences. It was Hickok who suggested that Eleanor publish a running account of her daily experiences and spent hours editing her drafts. End quote. And this resulted in the ladies press corps to give a voice, not just to herself, but to other up and coming women who worked in media and journalism, Eleanor held 348 press conferences. One was held in the first week of FDR's presidency and the last took place on the week of his death. She also held her own annual press party. It was called the Grid Iron Widows Party. This was a response to the Grid Iron Club dinner which was the president's press party, and it was closed to women. This party was, quote, her indignant response to the fact that FDR and the men of the cabinet went off to the sacred and exclusive male journalist's annual Gridiron Club dinner, end quote. Press parties were quite successful. It resulted in the surreal situation where male journalists demanded access to these press parties and to Eleanor's press conferences. And in these press conferences and press meetings, Eleanor really flexed herself as an independent voice and one that was unashamedly womanly. Quote, Roosevelt broke the bounds of respectable femininity by her very physicality. She was tall, seen by many as unattractive, had a shrill voice that she used without apology to say controversial things, even contradicting her president husband on occasion, end quote. And what gave her the motivation and the inspiration and the sense of safety to directly challenge the patriarch of the United States directly from the White House was her relationship with Lorena. Quote, secure in the knowledge that she was loved by the most important woman in her life, Eleanor was able to create a public persona that was to earn the love of millions. Quote, you taught me more than you know, and it brought me happiness. You've made of me so much more of a person just to be worthy of you, end quote. Now, this is something that harkens back to these 19th century Boston marriages. Again, if you read anything written by women in these relationships, this is the kind of profound, at least, friendship that women had with each other. At the time that Eleanor is in this relationship with Lorena, there is a great deal of suspicion 
regarding women who are getting a little too close to other women. When Freud sparked the sexual revolution, people lost the ability to see these relationships as innocent, plutonic, and non-sexual. There was a great deal of suspicion attached to them, and there was a risk in being this close to another woman. That said, Eleanor and Lorena were not afraid to be themselves with each other. Their relationship was, quote, intimate, contentious, romantic, and queer, end quote. And you can see just how much they meant to each other through their writings and their actions. For example, when FDR was inaugurated president at the high point of his life, when Eleanor would reach the highest possible station for a woman in the United States as First Lady, at the ceremony, there when FDR was being sworn in, Eleanor's thoughts were with Lorena. There, wearing a sapphire ring that Lorena had given to her, she would say, quote, all day I've thought of you. Oh, I want to put my arms around you. I ache to hold you close. Your ring is a great comfort. I look at it and think she does love me or I wouldn't be wearing it. And her thoughts were often with Lorena. For example, she would also write, quote, my dear, if you meet me in public, may I forget there are other reporters present or must I behave? I shall want to hug you to death. I can hardly wait, end quote. Even Eleanor's room had evidence of her love of Lorena, quote, my pictures are all nearly up and I have you in my sitting room where I can look at you most of my waking hours. I can't kiss you, so I kiss your picture. Good night and good morning. Don't laugh, <laughs> end quote. Some historians have tried to just focus on that and literally just say, they were gal pals. But subsequent letters between them, there were over 3,000 letters in all. Eleanor would sometimes write to Lorena more than once a day, contain language that honestly can only be interpreted one way. Here is an example, quote, good night, dear one. I want to put my arms around you and kiss you at the corner of your mouth. And in a little more than a week now, I shall. Oh, dear one, it is the little things, tones in your voice, the feel of your hair, gestures. These are the things that I think about and long for. I wish I could lie down beside you tonight and take you in my arms." End quote. And this passage, as we'll see later in the video, became one of particular concern for the biphobic historians who would try to write about this relationship in ways totally stripped of their sexual implications. And this is something that Hickok reciprocated. For example, she wrote to Eleanor, quote, your eyes with a kind of teasing smile in them and the feeling of that soft spot just northeast of the corner of your mouth against my lips, end quote. It's not known whether or not FDR knew what was going on. When he commissioned the construction of the Valkyl estate, he must have known that they had these bathrobes with each other's entwined initials. He must have known or gotten the sense by Eleanor's obsessive letter writing that something was going on between her and Lorena. But because of the intentional suppression of records, it's difficult to know where FDR was in this scenario. Personally, I like to think that the towering giant of American history knew about his wife's bisexuality and supported it, but it's difficult to know. Eleanor's last major action would be one that changed the world. She was the first United States delegate to the United Nations, and she was the one in charge with drafting the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights at President Truman's request. It's here, if we go back to Jennifer Reed's definition of Roosevelt's queerness as something that just was radically transgressive of all the different sort of boundaries that uh, were imposed upon Eleanor, that we really see her work in the United Nations as the pinnacle of her queer activism. The committee was composed of all sorts of different people. Quote, Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, representatives of democracies and dictatorships, colonial powers, and once colonized peoples. 
and cold. But the fact that she had lived so much of her life outside of the boundaries of what was acceptable for a oligarchic, white, heterosexual woman, that her, quote, consciousness was not only quite ahead of its time, but informed by that quintessentially queer ability of at least trying to operate outside the hierarchical binary organization. And this allowed her to, quote, work explicitly on behalf of those defined as others in a culture that naturalized white, middle-class, male, heterosexual supremacy, end quote. So in doing that great work of creating that great document, it's something that was informed by her queer experiences throughout her life. You'll notice the title of this video is Eleanor Roosevelt's Hidden Bisexuality. But so far, I focused exclusively on her relationship with other women because it was those relationships that really seemed to make her into the person that she was. But she did have dalliances with other men. In 1929, she had a possibly illicit relationship with her bodyguard, Earl Miller. She was 44, he was 32. Quote, they had a mutually powerful connection that was read by many around her as romantic, end quote. However, just like her uh, affairs with other women, it's difficult to know what was really going on here because the records have been destroyed. Quote, Eleanor Roosevelt's friendship with Earl Miller has been and remains an amazing study of denial and lost documents. No other friendship has been so well covered up, end quote. After FDR's death, she would form a, quote, intimate companionship with one David Guerowich, who was married and 18 years her junior. She wrote, quote, I love you as I love and have never loved anyone else. When she purchased a home and allowed David and her wife Edna to move in with her, Edna, quote, knew that she had to make room for Roosevelt as an intimate in their lives and did so seemingly with great love, end quote. Can you look at that and say, you know, we know from this that this was a sexual relationship? No. But it does seem to be a queer relationship in that it's outside what would have been conventional heterosexual behavior at the time. So that has been a look at how Eleanor's bisexuality affected her life. Now we need to talk about why so few people know about this. And it is because Eleanor's bisexuality offers a depressingly wonderful example of how queer erasure happens. Lorena Hickok donated her thousands upon thousands of letters between her and Eleanor to the FDR Presidential Archives. And in 1978, these archives were opened. And it was at a time where homophobia was still running rampant in United States society. And her son, FDR Jr., was not happy that these documents were being opened to the public. He demanded that the presidential library close these records immediately because the archives were supposed to, quote, protect particularly the heirs who might be damaged, harassed, or otherwise injured by publication of the Hickok Papers. So determined was he to erase the loving relationship that existed between Eleanor and Lorena from history that he showed up to the FDR library with his lawyer to harass and intimidate the library director William R. Emerson and the acting archivist James O'Neill into closing the papers. Now, they refused to close the papers, but according to FDR Jr., Quote, the procedures of all presidential libraries are now being changed to protect heirs. But unfortunately, in this incident, the damage has been done. End quote. And that really makes me wonder, you know, are there letters, you know, between FDR 
and Eleanor were FDRs talking about the rocking twink that he had sex with the night before? Are there letters where Eleanor explains her bisexuality to her husband and her husband is cool with it? What was really going on between Eleanor and her bodyguard? What was going on between Eleanor and David Gerwich and his wife? We'll never know thanks to the actions of their asshole son. To further bury the lead and run damage control, FDR Jr. enlisted a prominent writer by the name of Joseph P. Lash, who would write a book regarding Eleanor and her, quote, many friendships, to make it seem as sexless as possible. And FDR Jr. was quite open about his motivation in commissioning this work. Quote, the Hickok papers, taken out of context, could give an impression of a lesbian relationship between mother and Hickok that I have decided to commission Joe Lash, who won a Pulitzer Prize, to write about her many friendships. End quote. To add a little more insult to injury here, FDR Jr. and Joe Lash profited immensely from the book sales. And this is something that affected subsequent queerphobic historians. Uh, for example, Doris Faber wrote, quote, The Life of Lorena Hickok, Eleanor Roosevelt's Friend. Doris is quite open in her writings about how she felt about this. She said that when she first opened and read these letters between them, she entered, quote, a classic state of shock, end quote. She very clearly believed that Eleanor's authentic love for Lorena was something scandalous and evil and damaging. Quote, Eleanor Roosevelt was a great woman, and her effusively affectionate letters should be removed at least until the year 2000. Couldn't this collection be locked up again at least for several more decades? End quote. One historian wrote regarding Faber's book that, quote, Faber despises Hickok and loathes homosexuals, end quote. Fortunately, we do have a feminist lesbian historian who was able to show the love that Eleanor and Lorena had together. This was a woman by the name of Blanche Wiesen Cook, and she had already done work exposing queer erasure. She wrote an article called, quote, The Historical Denial of Lesbianism, end quote, which was a critical review uh, regarding a book called Miss Marks and Miss Woolley, where she exposed that book's queerphobic erasure of its subjects. And she was quite open in describing the motivations of the queerphobic historians who denied what was going on between Lorena and Eleanor. Quote, since friendships and love are rarely about straight teeth or bony clavicles, one must pause to ask how it has served history to caricature Lorena Hickok and why we, she was for so long disregarded. The answer in retrospect seems evident. Today, our generation continues to cringe and turn away from cross-class, cross-generational, or same-sex relationships, end quote. She laughs at a lot of historians' attempt to read very clearly romantic and sexual language in a way that would deny it. Quote, Eleanor Roosevelt repeatedly ended her 10, 12, 15 page letters with expressions of love and longing. There are few ambiguities in this correspondence, and a letter that was defined as, quote, particularly susceptible to misinterpretation, end quote, reads, I wish I could lie down with you tonight and take you in my arms, end quote. And she was particularly blunt in describing their relationship generally. Quote, the fact is that Eleanor Roosevelt and Hickok were not involved in a schoolgirl smash. They did not meet in a 19th century storybook or swoon unrequitedly upon a 19th century campus. They were neither saints nor adolescents, nor were they virgins or mermaids. They were two adult women in the prime of their lives, committed to working out a relationship under very difficult circumstances." End quote. And one last quote where Blanche Cook just gets right down to the brass tacks. Quote, "...they knew the score. They touched each other deeply, loved profoundly, and moved on. They wrote to each other exactly 
what they meant to write. Sigmund Freud notwithstanding, a cigar may not always be a cigar, but the northeast corner of your mouth against my lips is always the northeast corner." End quote. So, how have historians taken that in? Well, it's a mixed bag. On the one hand, William E. Leuchtenberg, who's been described as the Dean of New Deal Historians, wrote that the letters between the pair quote, makes clear not only that Eleanor Roosevelt was in love with Lorena Hickok, but also, at a critical time, Hickok was the most important person in the First Lady's life. It offers a startlingly different impression of Roosevelt from the traditional one, end quote. But Robert Cohen, in his article, Out of the Closet and Into History, states that a depressingly few number of historians are incorporating Cook's analysis and the revelations that seem to be so clearly stated in the letters between them, including them in their writings on Eleanor Roosevelt. Cohen says that he once approached a gay colleague on campus and asked what needs to be done to make historians more aware of the relationship between Eleanor and Lorena and to get them to admit that, in fact, it was a fully sexual relationship between them. Uh, his historian sarcastically replies, what would it take? Videotapes. <laughs> Which I think is something that can be applied to so many questions of who was queer or not in history because Eleanor is far from the only person with an extremely well-documented queer identity that is just flat-out denied by queerphobic and biphobic historians. That ends our inaugural video. I hope you liked it. My next video is going to be on the life of gay men in Puritan New England. Give this video a like and subscribe, and I'll get that video about gay life in Puritan New England out in maybe a week and a half or two weeks. Thanks again for listening to Cruising the Demimonde, Queer History in the World of Twilight. Have yourself a great day.